then I'll just move the screen up a little bit. Okay. The purpose of the mastermind is to learn leadership, build teams, and create multiple sources of income together. Jules? Oh, we are here to inspire and challenge each other to reach and exceed goals. Each member is committed to their own success, as well as the success of every member of the group. We are committed to meeting in person or virtually for one hour every week. We are present. <laughs> there is no multitasking or distractions during meetings. We are collaborative. We listen without interrupting, lecturing, or judging. We celebrate each other's successes without jealousy. We are honest and participate by giving thoughtful feedback. There you go. We are open and listen to different perspectives without being defensive or offering excuses. We trust fellow members enough to share fully. We are focused, but we also think it's important to have fun during meetings. We are real and authentic. This is a no bullshit zone. <laughs> we allow ourselves to become completely aligned with each other and the high forces. One mind, one soul, one love. Oops, sorry. Noble Goldman International is a conscious, aware, and engaged global community of abundance and freedom creators. Our mission is to create one million millionaires who are free from the time for money paradigm. We focus on creating multiple streams of income through masterminding, team building, and the effective utilization of the internet-based platforms. The mastermind becomes an opportunity for, for self-mastery, where the self-transcendent shift from the me to the we to the us occurs. As congruence and engagement increases, the world's consciousness is then raised one meaningful and inspired relationship at a time. Beautiful. Okay. Oh, hi, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I don't know, maybe I'm just really driven today, but I want to get started. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like that's like any other day. I know. Like the leader coming out in UV. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Um, I just thought it'd be interesting this time to talk a little bit about uh, something that comes up quite a bit um, with Gary's conversations and um, how he speaks about coming from the highest level and it's the only place to make true change and quick change. Um, but I'm not sure how much people understand about the different kind of levels that Gary kind of teaches um, and how to recognize what what level you might be coming from in your problem solving or conversations or um, life in general. So I thought we could talk about that. Logical levels. Yes. Do you want me to get the picture up? Yeah, that would be awesome. Let me explain a little bit the origination of logical levels. And logical levels actually comes from the work of Gregory Bateson. And Gregory Bateson was um, the life partner and, um, well, life partner and lover of Margaret Mead, um, the very famous um, cultural anthropologist. And Gregory, unbeknownst to many people in the, uh, in the origins of, uh, of neurolinguistic programming, when uh, John Grinder and Richard Bandler were originally developing the ideas, they had done a modeling project on Virginia Satir, on Fritz Perls, and on Milton Erickson to develop um, the entire theory and process structure for um, the beginning of really the science of human excellence. But little was, was known about who they used as a mentor and who they used was Gregory Bateson. And Gregory Bateson was, uh, was the individual who they would go to when they were um, questioning the validity of part of the research or uh, questioning some of the conclusions that they drew from the modeling they did of these three very famous therapists. So um, Gregory was sort of the overall grandfather of the science of human excellence uh, or neurolinguistic programming. Uh, 
So the first, the first level, if we look at this, at this graph, is um, environments. When and where am I? So this is about how human beings survive. It's a bit, it's reminiscent of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. Yeah. But, yeah. but it is a bit different. Yeah. So the environment piece is where, when and where am I? Meaning what's the context in which my life is existing in and where am I, you know, expressing my, myself in what environment? Some people will, um, will be in the environment of a family. Some people will be in an environment of being single. Some people are, are spending three quarters of their day in an organization. Some people um, have no organization. They're solopreneurs. So the environment, when and where am I? The second one is behavior, meaning what behaviors do I have to do to be able to exist and thrive in the environment in which I am. So what behaviors do I have to do? The next is, and I guess the, the question is, what, and, and what will I do differently in this environment? Because we all adapt to our environments. The next thing is capabilities. Um, what and how have I learned? meaning that in an environment, we adapt our behaviors, and in that adaptation, we take on, when we build new resources, and we discover how our capabilities can become more increased to help us survive more um, successfully in the environment in which we're at. So the capabilities to the adapting to our environment and uh, creating different types of behaviors to succeed in that environment we develop new capabilities uh, and new learnings. The next is beliefs and values. And I think this is, this is something I think is, is really uh, important is that then after I uh, uncover what I've, uh, how I've learned in my environment, the new behaviors I have, the new capabilities that I have developed, out of those capabilities in each experience, because we're meaning-making creatures, creates a constellation of different beliefs. Values are simply extremely important beliefs. So as we look at how we're adapting to our environment, the new behaviors that we're learning to thrive in that environment, the capabilities that build from doing new behaviors, then we have to look at what are the beliefs and the values we hold true to be able to succeed in that environment. And then the next is identity. Who am I actually? And that is, uh, I think, uh, a radically important, um, important aspect of the logical levels. The last is, um, what am I part of? So identity is about who am I? Like, what's my purpose? Why am I here? The vision is really spirituality. What am I a part of? What is bigger than my identity? What am I a, what am I a part of? And what does my identity serve in the larger whole? And what Gregory Bateson would say, and this is what I, I found really beautiful about his work, he would say that there's no resolution at the same logical level. So if I was going to uh, change or try to change a behavior in some way, I'm not gonna change it completely by shifting to a new alternative behavior. I have to go up to what are my capabilities? What are my beliefs and values? And then who am I? And then what is that a larger part of? He would, he would say that in order to shift at the deepest intrinsic level, at the higher logical level you make the change on, the more profound the change is on all the other lower logical levels. So when a person has a spiritual awakening, it changes your sense of identity. It shifts your belief and values. It expands your capabilities. It definitely impacts your behavior, which then changes the environment in which you're existing in. 
Now, when we, we look at this, this is so applicable in so many different contexts from our physical environment to even our emotional environment. So if, if we go to the, the sort of the age old um, concept of the drama triangle, where one person, and we all do this, by the way, it's not like, oh, one of us is doing and suddenly I've stopped. Is this something that we all do? Is I'm a victim, they're the villain, and here's, I'm looking for my, my hero over here. So in the environment of your own emotional states, if that is, that's a, 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 an aspect of our cultures that has been like, I think completely um, undercover. It's so unconscious in our cultures, this drama triangle. So if we were to look at our emotional states as the environment of being in this sort of victim state or drama, if we were to go up to the highest logical level or even up to identity and say, well, who am I really? In the larger context of this environment of me feeling like a victim, as I walk through my world, I'm always at the effect of something. I'm not necessarily a cause. I, I, people do things or, or life does things and then I'm, I'm reacting to those things. If we were to look at it from who am I really and then what am I really a larger part of? And we were to say to ourselves, I am the creator of my own reality. Therefore, I am the creator of whether my happiness is sustainable or whether it's simply not sustainable whatsoever. If we made the decision that the emotional environment of staying in that victim or that drama triangle could be shifted by going into the creator triangle, which is I'm accountable. So who am I really? I am accountable for my own emotional states. I ascribe the meaning to what's occurring outside of me. Therefore, I am part and parcel of the solution. I can ascribe a different meaning. And then you look at, okay, what am I a part of, a larger system that I'm a part of? That becomes that sort of aspect of us where we look at then, since I'm a spark of the divine and I'm creating my own reality, then am I not creating this, this aspect of how I'm experiencing whatever I'm experiencing in my external world. What can I do? What can I choose differently to be able to create a, a sustainable change from the part of what am I a part of all the way down to my emotional environment internally. So this applies the whole logical level, level idea is about the higher you chunk up and it's always spirituality. It will always go there. The higher I chunk up, the less I am prone to live in this aspect of being a victim of life around me. And so this is why even in the, in the very foundation of creating a neurolinguistic programming, Gregory Bateson was, was the, um, the siren of that there needs to be a spiritual context to the development of NLP. Uh, Richard Bandler and John Grinder never adhered to that, but Robert Diltz did. And Robert Diltz was, I won't say he was a co-founder, but he wrote some of the most definitive books on the science. <clears throat> um, I did, I can't even tell you how many trainings I did with Robert Diltz, uh, but he was a, he is a miraculous man. And he began to um, develop trainings. I remember one training I did with him in Hawaii called Tools of the Spirit. And it was all about bringing in a sense of spirituality into all of the NLP work. So um, this is where we can create just so much more traction. I know for, for myself, whenever I get stuck, and let's say I get overwhelmed or my resources are really low and I'm exhausted or super tired and I just am uh, prone to uh, the drama triangle, I will go, well, who am I really? And when I meditate, I attach back to that, that center or that core of myself and I come back to normal. So when we're looking at where's our quick fix, where's our most dynamic fix, 
it's always going to be and how and how we view whatever our relationship is what we define as god for us so one of the things i thought was that i, I first of all i want to open up um the conversation to everyone else and talk about or share how we have utilized that sort of chunking up process to the highest logical level and then what we experience with whatever we considered our problem when we are able to connect to that part of ourselves at a higher level so i'm gonna um i'm gonna open it up so veronica i would love to hear from you darling on how you actually because we're all using logical levels at some level but we're not necessarily aware of what we're doing but i'm going to hand that over to veronica veronica how, how do you experience lo logical levels in your environment um definitely without even looking at this logical levels diagram anymore values is how i make all my decisions so i know that if something is not working out for me during the day then i tap into my values and go is this even even where i want to go is this even part of my life part of my values so definitely um i'm still working on the spiritual aspect to tap into that i guess um yeah it's not my it's not my first go-to so i think um maybe meditation is more for the, to actually tap into that for me would be good um but it also occurred to me while you were talking that with the environment, um, how much our environment has changed around us due to COVID and how are we actually, you know, and we probably, when you look at the state of people around us who are struggling or who have, you know, not, yeah, they're really struggling with what's happened with COVID um, and how it's changed everything around us. How, how important this tool would be because it's so env our environment has changed and we have to change our behaviors and our, you know and learn more capabilities and and know what our beliefs and values are um, this would be such a powerful tool just to be teaching people well and and I, I like to yes and you're absolutely right about the our physical environments because covid really has changed things um, and at the same time, you know, we also have an emotional environment. We have a, a mental environment. I don't know how many of you ever get thought possessed, meaning that you get stuck on something and you can't work through it and you can't, and you think about it, think about it, think about it, think about it. That is also a environment, like our mental environment. How do we then resolve the mental environment, our emotional environment, our physical environment? It's, it's all still based on going up to the highest logical level so um yeah i mean COVID has has struck all of us pretty deeply i was having a conversation with my my very best friend who i don't i don't think you ever knew him uh v his name is danny king and um he was a queenslander and he showed up at one of my trainings um living in his van he said i can pay you 20 dollars a month for 10 years uh, but i have to do this training and i said fair enough come along and he did he took he took years but he never missed a payment and um we ended up being like the best of mates and he was telling me he said i don't get this COVID stuff it's like there's only a few cases here in Australia and they closed down the whole country and I'm confused and I'm angry and I'm like, yeah, I get that. <laughs> but, and then I was telling him what's going on here in, in America, how there's two or 3,000 people dying a day from COVID and how it's, it's quite real and it's quite, um, quite like aggressive. And now they've just discovered there's a new more contagious variant than the Delta variant. Um, that's in the United States, like right now, and and so there's all these different um, these different ways that we'll be viewing it, um, and I I could see how it would be very confusing to Australians if there's there's very little um, exposure and very little chance of getting it because it's being contained so rigorously, um, and I can understand the the frustration all of it calls for a deeper sense of our own resources inside of ourselves all of it does 
Um, so you, we, cannot, we cannot lose by becoming more resourceful, more flexible, more agile in our lives, less rigid, less, um, I'll use the word less political and, and more about surrendering over to whatever is in front of us. I remember I, I had the great good fortune of meeting Byron Katie and um, Byron, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Byron Katie, loving what is, but um, one, we had a mutual student and she, um, she kept saying, you two have to meet, you two have to meet, you have to, you have to have a conversation, you have to know each other. So I met her at a, at a restaurant in San Diego, California, where we were living at the time. And um, I walked in, was in, out on a patio by Balboa Park. And um, I, w I saw her and I walked up to the table and neither one of us could speak. We sat there in silence and wept for 45 minutes before we could speak <laughs> to each other. Um, she's an amazing woman. And one of the things that she would always say if it is in existence in your life, like if it is, it's God's will. How do we know that the part that this particular, that this particular thing is playing, it's uncomfortable to the mind, it's uncomfortable to the ego, but how do we know the part that that part plays in our overall learning and our overall evolution? How do we know? And so she would say, love what is. Meaning that when you love what is, you take all the judgment, all the evaluation, you step into this higher state of there is a bigger force operating in every single one of our lives every day by the circumstances that we are surrounded with. We can shake our fists at the sky. We can get all angry at a virus or at the government or whatever we think we need to be angry at. But the truth of it is, if it is, it has a purpose in our life and there's something of value, something to be learned, a new capability to uh, build, a new belief to hold, a new agility to achieve. And I, I personally love that concept. Now, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's been, it's been um, a process of learning how to surrender. And I'm just going to go there for just a minute. There's so many things in my life that I've got judgment on. But when I step back and get clear, and ultimately at the end of the day, like if I don't meditate, I kind of turn into a, what's the word? A troll. <laughs> I guess that's the best word I can use for it. If I, I, I seriously require to meditate, to return myself to that place, because if I don't go to that place, then I forget that place even exists. So it's a constant repurposing of focus. And, uh, you know, I've said for years, you know, your focus is your prayer. And be careful with the God that you're praying to, because that God will answer you with more evidence of itself. So if I think that the world sucks and, and you know, the governments are crazy and, and the virus isn't real and it's all a plot or whatever I want a conspiracy thing I want to make up, I'm just going to get more of that. And all that conversation is really about being a victim, all of it. Um, so what we need to start looking at is how do we step out of victimization? How do we step more into actualization? And, and I'll go back to Byron Katie's work, loving what is. If it is, we have to have a certain level of how we build capabilities around it. Rather than curse it, embrace it, accept it, be agile with it, instead of having upset and anger in us, I think it's, or fear, I think it's really important that we love what is. Ultimately, at the end of the day, that particular practice of loving what is, I think is one of the most important practices that we can have from the perspective that we're gonna be called upon to surrender at the end of our lives. You know, our bodies is what we think we are. For most of us, we think we are this. But the truth of it is we sorely are not. And at the end of our lives, we're going to be called upon to leap out of our bodies into this big void of the unknown. And 
if we don't practice surrendering over to something higher, if we don't practice knowing that when we do, peace actually comes, if we don't practice this process, then we will not, we will not die very peacefully. If we can surrender over now and practice this process of agility around what is, then we have so much more capability of dancing out of our bodies at the end of our lives because we have well and truly practiced jumping into smaller, big voids and come out the other side of it just fine. So I don't know why I'm going off on this rant, but I seem to be. Uh, so I don't know just why. I would like you. Know. you. I'd love you I, to repeat that last sentence. <laughs> oh, let's see. What did I say? <laughs> we must practice. We must yes, practice. We must practice surrender because when we are, when we're going to, when we're going to pass, that's going to be the bigger, biggest surrender we've ever done. We're going to have to <laughs> leap into a void. And we're going to have to give up the thing we think we are, which is our bodies and our identity and our families and our, our reality and what all we, we think we've created up to this point. And we're going to have to leap into the unknown. And if we don't practice leaping into the unknown now and expect that we're going to be like so good at it at the end of our lives that we're not going to claw the sheets of our beds to stay in our bodies because we're too terrified. We're not going to be caught, not going to be loved, <laughs> not going to be shown the way on the other side. I think that if we show, if we prove to ourselves over and over and over again that every time we have agility, every time we surrender, we're always caught. We always survive. There's something that always catches us. And then we see in hindsight the purpose of the things that we went through. And in that, what we see then is, wow, maybe I can trust the unknown. I'm saying we require to build up that level of neurology, that habit of surrendering over and saying, it's going to be fine. It, it's going to be fine. Robert's really good at that. Um, whenever I get like really rigid, I'm like, this is not okay. This, this right here is not okay. <laughs> He'll go, everything's going to be fine. We're always taken care of. It's all good. It's just going to be like a piece of cake and we're just going to hot knife through butter. It's all going to be good. And I'm like, I know that's right, but this is what my ego wants, and it's not what my mind wants. I think it should look like this. Um, but as I as I continue to mature, I do understand that it rarely um, looks like what I think it should look like, and it always turns out just fine. I had a beautiful big sign which I made myself on my fridge in, in my house in Amsterdam, and it just said, embrace uncertainty and i think i've said this to you guys before uh, but it's such a beautiful quote from the uh, course of miracles where it says all things past present and to come is gently planned by one who unconditionally loves me <laughs> and <clears throat> that's a good quote that's a very good quote repeat it so, please yes all things past, past present. present, and to come is gently planned by one who unconditionally loves me. So I know Lisa's still writing, but Lisa, would you like to go next on how this concept of logical levels has impacted your life, how, how you use it or how you will use it in the future? Um, I actually find myself using Byron Katie's work a fair bit that every time I'm having an issue, of, I guess it's the same with everyone. We're always believing something that isn't true. Mm -hmm. And that's a really great way to get yourself out of that and <laughs> back into logical thinking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, a, so it's amazing. It's a shocking sometimes when you realize how ridiculous your beliefs are. <laughs> I, I love I love some of her her questions on the turnaround. It's like, um, is what I'm thinking true? Can I absolutely unequivocally know that it's true? And then, who am I without this belief? Who am I 
without this belief. Mm -hmm. And I, I've thrown another spin on it, which is how many different ways then can I look at it that would bring me peace? And that, that shifts me right up to a higher logical level. So when we question the conclusions that, that we come to, I think it, it's a really, really necessary aspect to question ourselves. Because what we're questioning is our mind and our mind is being conditioned by all the uh, aspects of everything that we've experienced and, uh, and imprinted from our culture and our family of origin. So it's a good thing to challenge. Yeah. Is there any is there anything you want to add or subtract from that? Um, sometimes I get all caught up in what other people think of me. If someone's blaming me for something I haven't done, or if I think something's unfair, and then I realize that they're only caught up in their own illusions as well. And then and that helps me just let go. I don't even care what they think because it's I know it's not true, even if they don't yet. Yeah. No, I, I totally get that. I love this one saying, um, back in the day when you guys were all little children, <laughs> I, don't think I don't know if that's true or not, but there was this woman um, who was as big as Tony Robbins, and no one knows about her now at all, but her name was Terry Cole Whitaker, and she was a science of mind minister, and uh I was friends with her. I went to her church. Um, I remember once she got up on stage and said, get a black felt tip pen, take out the Bible, mark every sentence, single sentence out, mark it out, black it out in the Bible that doesn't have to do with love and truth and kindness and humanity and forgiveness. And she said, you'll have about five pages. And she said, the rest is crap. That's the true teachings. Those five pages are the true teachings of Christ. And I was like, damn girl, that took a lot. Because this was way back in the day. And um, she, she would say, what you think of me is none of my business. Meaning, it's a projection from what you have concluded that I'm doing based upon what you would be doing in the same evaluation. So what you're seeing is an actu actually a reflection of yourself transferred onto the screen of me. So what you think about me is none of my business, it is your business. And I loved that, mm. absolutely loved that. Um, I thought it was very wise. Very free. But yeah, she was, she was a badass mystic, that woman. She really was. <laughs> She really was. The world kind of, well, the media in America kind of put the screws to her and she just went under, uh, which was uncomfortable and, and hard to watch. But, um, mm. but her soul is, I'm sure she's ascended by now, but she was amazing. She really was. She helped a lot of people. Um, so I think Stan may be off or with maybe, I don't know. But let's, let's go to Nancy and then we'll come back to Stan. And we'll get Julie. Nancy, um, did anything we've been talking about make sense to you? And if so, how have you utilized this, this concept of logical levels in your life? Well, it was the first time I had seen it. And so as, I, as you were describing each level, going from the bottom to the top, I was describing the answers, this, my snapshot answer in the moment awesome <laughs> and um so maybe is it okay if i share oh it, what, i'm asking you to please oh okay great and my, i won't remember the prompts exactly like i i you know the actual okay. yeah. words at level but so fr starting from the bottom so who am i and where am i i um i'm in the wise woman era of my life and I am at home on earth. Um, the next one was that I must prioritize self-care and personal and spiritual growth. The next up is um, I just have serving a greater number of people. I guess something to do with a learning curve, capability. 
Uh, the next step is uh, being of service to God, self, and others. Uh, then uh, I am a child of God, divinely created to serve my unique purpose. And then the one at the top is I am a limb of God's tree of life. And um, so I just wanted to share that. It feels, it feels real right now. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. When we live that through, I mean, there's nothing that can kind of stop us and no experience in the world that can alter us. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, that is where we're all heading is to this great merging of, uh, of our souls back to one. Yeah. And I want to just say that I, I so appreciate that you talk about God because um, God, you know, in a lot of personal and spiritual growth circles, God can be um, the term, you know, if people want to uh, couch it in other ways for fear of sounding unevolved or something like that. And um, it's just, uh, it's really, it's really meaningful to me and it's helped me to feel really comfortable here in this group with you um, that I can actually speak in the words that I use within myself mm. um, while still honoring everyone else's way yeah. of expressing as well. So I just want to personally thank you for um, making that language okay. Yeah, well, you're most welcome. I think that <laughs> when we've been wounded by by religions, then God yeah. becomes a force that that is tied to the rituals and the misconception sure. of the great mystics' teachings. And I think we have to make friends with God again. I mean, we have to sort of take that. Well, you know, what's really funny, Gary, is like in in every so often I have these ideas about whether I want to do. Uh, host one of the masterminds and the 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 title that always comes to me is what about god <laughs> because it does feel like you know can we can we talk about this because i really feel like it's a, a subject that is really danced around um in a lot of ways um and i understand why too because frankly i mean shoot i went you know was raised catholic and then when my kids were in Catholic school, I was like the Buddhist mom, you know, I mean, I was sort of like, so I, I know what that feels like, but I also know what for me, what I personally have experienced a returning and that's also very real for me. So it's just, um, yeah, I think it's more about giving a voice to those of us who say God. <laughs> I, I, I like, like that. Yeah. I, like yeah. I know uh, Robert and I just moved to Arkansas, which is a state I never thought I would ever really live in. But we had some rental properties there and circumstances, as life does, uh, dictated that that was probably the best place for us right now. And Robert's mom's last kind of cycles of, of her life to just yeah. give her the best environment to live in. So we moved there. We bought a house there. It's got a downstairs apartment. It's, it's really good. Um, it's good value there. And there was this, there's this little Unitarian Universalist church there. And I, I spoke there um, not, well, maybe about a year ago. And, and I kept thinking, you know, circumstantially we're being pulled back there. And then I thought, well, maybe I'm supposed to like do stuff in, cause there's a church on every corner there. <laughs> so I thought, maybe I'm supposed to like get out there and talk God, but talk God in a way that is not judgmental, that is inclusive, that is um, a different way of actually um, embracing what Christ's teachings were. Because I view Christ's teachings as sacred as I view Buddha or Muhammad's or, or the great Sikh masters and, and Krishna and every other master that ever came and incarnated on this planet because there's a golden thread that runs through all of it 
And it's always about how we treat one another. It's always about that. How, that is how God is expressed is in our treatment of one another. So, you know, if people are like, oh, and I can't find God, you know, I don't know what God is. It's like, look into the eyes of another, have compassion, have empathy, help as you can, and <laughs> love what is. And then that peace starts to come to you. And I think that that's a really, really powerful way to begin to start creating or rekindling a relationship with whatever we want to call the creator for ourselves. But there is undeniably a creative force flowing through time and space in every living molecule on the planet, and it is ecstatic love. In its essence, it is ecstatic love. So we're surrounded by it. It's just that our focus is so externalized that we don't embrace it. Our minds are so disrupted by our inability to accept what is that we're constantly judging, condemning, and separating off. And then we cannot connect to it. Yeah. And what's so, interesting about what you just said too, I think the other group that I've always wanted to have, I wanted to call semantics because semantics are just so they're so uh, integral to our communication, like just in just having discussions about what does this word mean to you? You know, we can bridge communication and misunderstandings. Um, but what you just said um, about, it made me think of the word sin. So when I think of the word sin to me, and it, and it actually is derived from, um, Word means off off the mark, missing, missing the, the mark. mark. Yeah, missing the mark. To me, that's what sin is, is just missing the mark, which we're all doing all the time. All the time. But it doesn't mean that we're doing bad things and being bad people, right? So I mean that's kind of the thing, but it's like, so then words like sinners and things like that, I'm not so triggered by anymore because I I feel like I have a way of, of um, understanding that. But yeah, so it's interesting because all of this, I think um, just just chatting about what different words mean to us is really It's super important because language creates. And um, mm -hmm. that's why, you know, I, I love the idea of the Hopi elders saying there is no past, there is no future. Because the past, I have all the all all the imprints, thought forms, capabilities of my ancestors in my DNA, and there is no future because as I speak my word, the future is already manifesting towards me. So there really isn't a future. Only in that that sacred moment of now is there is that capability of creating. Now we're all we're all. Um, not excellent at this, not excellent at walking around in our lives, being stone cold aware of everything we do uh, and the consequences of it. But the truth of it is to know it, embrace it and do it as much as we can. Even if it's five minutes a day, it's better than being asleep 24 seven. So we need to start somewhere and practice this sort of art of surrender, going up to that highest logical level connecting to whatever that concept is for us and for me it's god you know i have got i've got a brick pride in saying that but but that is what we require each one of us individually to do if we're going to remain agile in this world but especially with all the uncertainty around us this is i think the environment of the world today this is where each one of us will get the greatest sustenance and the greatest peace is in that practice that spiritual practice and self-define it for yourself but um but it's important there is one thing i i wanted to share really quickly i went to the chiropractor today and i have a very cool chiropractor so we were in this conversation and it was gary do you know about the concept of the mother tree and i'm like well i i i've been around mother trees before he goes well, I was reading this and it fascinated me. And he said, I wish human beings could be like trees. And I said, well, elaborate. And he said, well, when, when they go into the forest, a forest for lumber, they never take the largest trees in the forest because 
the largest trees in the forest are all interconnected by a fungal layer around the roots to the entire forest floor. So what they do is they, when the mother trees are left, the forest regrows five times as fast as if the mother trees were taken down because what the mother trees do is they feed the rest of the soil. So any seedlings, any dormant seeds will begin to sprout through the nurturing of the mother trees in every forest. And then I thought, and he, you know, he said it as well, that what if human beings could be more like the mother trees where, you know, we are assisting, we are helping, but the bottom line is much of what we can do is shift this, our vibratory resonance here and in here and be the ones to source through that kind of power of our own peace to help as many people as we can. Because there is a resonance that each one of us issues off from us. And when we bring ourselves to a more total expression of who we are, I have this strong sense that it helps the entire planet. And Callie's nodding her head. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to add to that because I recognize every thought I've ever had um, creates instant, whether I see it straight away or whether I see it in a few days' time. And I know that every thought I ever have affects my children. I see them react, might be five, ten seconds later but they're already reacting to my verbal communication, but I already thought it. And so they already picked it up before I spoke. And then their reaction is because of what I'm speaking doesn't align with pure love. So their reaction might be anger or some kind of emotion, disagreement, um, any kind of reaction. But when I'm speaking my true authentic self in my mind before I speak of what I do want, that's pure heart consciousness, they pick it up and they're already telling me before I speak what I've thought. Awesome. awesome. So I know we manifest like this all the time. Every one of us on this planet is that powerful and so to be aware of our thoughts and speak from what we really want, not the fear, the judgment, the criticism of someone else, you know, just that simple bring it back to what you want that is alignment with what you want for humanity as well or any human being or just even your family is enough. But we forget to use that power. We get stuck in the emotion of, the criticism of the old wound and forget to use how simple it is to just change it into what you want. Yeah. So, so, so simple and quick. And it just creates so quickly. And, you know, the, the truth of it is we all deserve to have more peace, less frustration. And, the, and, you know, I catch myself all the time. Robert and I will coach each other. Uh, we'll go, oh, we're doing that again. Let's bring ourselves back. Uh, none of us are, are exquisite at it, but for God's sake, it is, the, it is the task at hand that we all require to do. It is the truth at hand. Thanks for that, Kelly. Um, Joe or Stan or Jules, do, does, do either one of you uh, choose to share anything that from your experience around the subject? I, I would quite like to. Go for it, Joel. <laughs> I've just so enjoyed listening to you, Nancy, and and um, Veronica originally, and of course you, Gary, and Carly. You just came in with a little bit of cream, creamy icing on top, um, <laughs> because you know our fears. I, I'm I'm talking about how quickly also the manifestation of our fears can also happen. So it's powerful, you know. God we doesn't really. Know really vigilance is required but vigilance has sort of a um a bit of a <laughs> a bit of a disciplinary sort of note to it but awareness at least that whew, where did that come from you know um where did that thought come from and if you've had a few things 
uh, happened to you in your past, which actually you must have created anyway before, beforehand, then you do become a little bit um, weary. Is that the word, weary? And um, But how often does that weariness move to, to such a point, which is half the world at the moment, or my, my, maybe three quarters, where they, the worst is first, you know, the worst is thought first. Yeah. And um, that's what I think can happen. So just lovely. I, and, and so many gems here this morning. You know, I looked up um, Terry Cole Whitaker and she's still alive and she's 81 and lives in Los Angeles or something. Lives in oh, really? She's still, she's still with yes. us? But... 81 years old. She's still alive. Well, according to Google. <laughs> so, um, Well, I need to send her off an email or, or yeah. something, connect, because... She was, um, she was, she was something in her day. Absolutely. I think to write our little things like you've just done, Nancy, with based on the the the, the triangle, the um, logical level alignment. Because I did, I did my NLP years and years ago now, but I can still remember all these things and with education training. So the, it's it's brilliant. We've had some brilliant people. Um, but yes, it's it's quite simple. We just and God, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All the we I, I think it's safe again now. <laughs> <laughs> well, even if it wasn't, I vote for us all to be rebels. That's what I'm. Thinking. I did I did a lot of study of the um, Kabbalah, you know, the original Kabbalah or the Christian mysticism, actually, yeah. and brilliant, brilliant meanings, you know, come from some of those powerful words, you know, um, yeah. the the words for God are uh, also very, very evocative, you know, and beautiful. So um, just about from every culture, really, every um, religion or every base. Um, it's all the same. Yeah, it is. It's all the same. All the so, same. Um, gosh, what a lovely, inspiring session. Thank you all. Yeah. It's beautiful. Joe, anyway. thank I don't you think I've got anything wise to say except <laughs> That's language, okay. language creates. That's what we <laughs> That's gorgeous. Joe, do you have anything you want to share, buddy? Or Stan, or? I, I can uh, hop on a second. I, I've got a storm coming through, so my internet's mm -hmm. terrible at the moment, so I got to stay off camera. But uh, no this is my first time seeing the logical level alignment pyramid thingy that you showed. And it was, it was interesting as I was listening to you speak about the levels, I was thinking to myself, you know, sort of like Nancy did, like, where am I with each of these levels? And some of them, I just, uh, I didn't really have a defined answer. I had thoughts and ideas, which, you know, still run around my mind like crazy. But it, it was very interesting that uh, uh, hopefully later tonight, I can sit down and take a moment to meditate on each one of these and actually put on paper, where am I with each of these levels? You know, how is these things affecting me? You know, <clears throat> I just found it very interesting, and I, I'm, I'm grateful that you shared this with us tonight. So thank you very much. Well, well thank V, because V is is the smart one. <laughs> she <laughs> emails me and goes, what do you think of this idea? And I'm like, I like it. Let's do it. <laughs> so V's, um, V goes under acknowledge. So I just want to acknowledge V for um, always picking such great topics for us to talk about. I don't under-acknowledge her. She's a wonder. Uh, yeah, she is. She is. Thank you for that, John. I'm getting the sense that Gary is uh, Jim Carrey in that uh, Say Yes to Everything movie where he just says yes to it all. Veronica has these amazing ideas, and Gary's just like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Veronica is a puppet master. I'm just a puppet on the end of the string. <laughs> don't tempt me. I might come up with something really devious next week. <laughs> Well, I will welcome it. <laughs> just, just please, just please don't make it another best version of yourself because that's one of the language things that's triggering you at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't stand it. Every time somebody says it, I think comparison, comparison <laughs> to what you know. So let's be our whole selves. Well, we are almost at the end of our call, so I'd like to end it like we always do with a word or a thought that we want to leave um, the group for the week. So um, 
Jules, give us a word from you. Oh my goodness! Give me, give me, give me a minute. Give me a minute. Okay, minute. Kelly. Um. Okay. I thought because remember that when my daughter picks up my thoughts, she, I also pick up hers. So it doesn't matter if I'm out in the community, wherever I walk, those thoughts may not be yours. So let them go. If it's something you think, oh my God, why am I thinking like this? Why am I judging this? Why am I critic? They may not be yours. It may be the person you just passed. That's how powerful. Thank you, Kelly. Awesome. Thank you for that. And Lisa, how about you? What would you like to leave the group with? Um, my, my word is create. And yeah, be careful what you think because you are creating. Even in the way you feel, you create instantly. If Very true. Go down the wrong track. Very true. And Nancy, if you had a word you'd like to leave with the group? Um, I will choose God. <laughs> good choice nancy <laughs> and and joe how about you my brother okay He's there you are up. i'm a little uh, lost on a word or a phrase today it's uh, unusual okay. usually i had some comment but uh <laughs> grateful gratitude sweet that would definitely be it because I'm so grateful for you two to be in my life as well as the rest of everybody that joins in on these calls because truly the name is of the group is, is so true, I transform and prosper. And that's what I have done since meeting you two. So thank you very much. And I am so grateful for you two to be in my life. Well, we're grateful to you as well, my friend. Um, Stanley, are you there? Dan, there you are. So is there a word you want to leave with the group, Stan, or anything um, you'd like to say? Lisa stole my word, um, so my word is create. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Great. Okay, my friend, thank you for that. Hang on. Julie, um, I would like to add <laughs> thoughtfulness. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Thanks for that. Veronica, how about you, darling? Well, I actually have a little poem. It's only short, but I, I heard it in um, a documentary that was recommended to me last night called Max Richter's Sleep. And this guy actually wrote an eight-hour um, music thing, eight hours full sleep. And at the end of it, someone says, what if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dreams you went to heaven? And there you plucked a strange and beautiful flower. And when you awoke, you had that flower in your hand. And what then? Oh, that's lovely. I think I've heard that before. <laughs> that, is that is. So my, my word is, oh, well, two words, practice surrender. Sorry? Practice surrender. Oh, yes. Lovely. Okay, gang, this is a wrap. V, thank you so much, darling. We probably need to catch up, and I need to get caught up on all of the emails you sent <laughs> what actions to take. But I do have a couple of questions for you, so I'll send you all off an email, okay? Right, yeah. And thank you for keeping me abreast of everything and staying on top of me and um, keeping me honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, gang. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. V. Thanks, Gary. Bye. Bye-bye. Love you guys. See Love ya. Love you too. Bye-bye.